a spiritual contemplation of threefolding. Yesterday and the day before, I attempted to present to you how necessary it is for the future evolution of humanity that human beings arrive at true self-knowledge, meaning a knowledge of humanity's being itself, and also that it is altogether impossible to arrive at a knowledge of humanity's being without first discovering the connection between that being and the more than earthly worlds. The physical body of the human being is only a small part of what it bears through the journey of its life. But this physical body alone, in the form in which it currently exists, is essentially a product of the earth. Everything else that is a part of the human being is not a product of the earth, as I discussed with you in the two previous lectures. Now the current physical structure of the human body already hints at the fact that the human being as such is a being with an existence that extends beyond the immediate present. To be sure, the physical structure of the body points directly toward the earthly. But within its earthly context, the physical structure of the human body directs us to look beyond this immediate historical moment into the past and into the future. We named several cognitive faculties of the human soul in the previous lectures, sense activity, intelligence, the ability to recollect things, and we also named feelings, desires and will activity as faculties of a more appetitive nature. Now if we ask ourselves, what must human beings have within their physical bodies that allow them to develop these cognitive faculties? We must direct our gaze toward the structure of the human head and everything that is connected with it. The physical structure of the human head is necessary, though only in the sense that I discussed yesterday, and really only in that sense in order for the capital I, for earthly human consciousness, to develop these cognitive faculties. It is not correct to believe, as a result, that the I-E-Y-E must necessarily be what brings about our sense of sight, but it is correct to say that the I-E-Y-E is the transmitter of sight experiences to the ego and to consciousness. And the same goes for the other, specifically the higher senses. In this way, and with many variations on what I have just said, the physical human body points directly toward the earthly, but at the same time it hints at something beyond the present moment, such that we can say, the physical body of a person that we see standing before us points backward toward that person's previous incarnation in the physical structure of the head. Just as our intelligence points backward toward the far distant past, toward sun evolution, so do our present physical bodies, with their earthly arrangement of cognitive soul faculties, meaning the directing of those cognitive faculties toward the ego consciousness, point backward toward our previous lifetimes. I have already drawn your attention in the past to what the human head actually is. Schematically, you could depict it as follows, and there's a drawing. The human being consists of a head and then of the rest of the body. Let us say that this is our current lifetime. This is our present lifetime, and this is our next lifetime, references to the pictures. We can say, the head we possess now in our current lifetime came about through a metamorphosis of the limbs and torso of the physical body that we possessed in our previous lifetime. And we have lost the head we had during that previous lifetime. Of course, I do not mean that the actual physical organism of our limbs and torso, that is self-evident. Rather, I mean the forces, the shaping powers that the physical structure possessed. Everything that we currently bear as part of our bodies, excluding the head, 
which is the bearer of our cognitive faculties, on behalf of our ego. Our limbs and torso, these will become the physical structure of our head in our next incarnation. You all bear within you now the forces that will be concentrated into your heads during your next earthly life, the actions that you take with your arms, the actions you perform with your legs. All of this will go into the inner structure of your head in your next incarnation. And the forces that stream outward from your head during your next earthly life, that becomes your karma, your destiny for the incarnation to come. But everything that is to become your destiny in that coming incarnation travels into those future lifetimes first through the limbs and torso that you have now. If, let us say, you have an intimate relationship with another person during one lifetime, this is something that involves actions taken by your physical body. This will then become a force within the structure of your head in your next incarnation, which will in turn affect your destiny. And so our head and the capacities within it are always connected with our previous incarnations, namely with the torsos and limbs we had during that prior lifetime. The human being lies at the root of these great transformations. The head is a transformed physical structure stemming from a prior incarnation, and the physical structure of the current body, and particularly its limbs, lays the foundation for the structure of the head in the next earthly life. In a certain sense, this has a definite practical significance for human society. And when people come to know that they are integrated into human evolution in this manner, then they begin to feel their way into this life on earth properly and will be able to understand certain things that would be otherwise incomprehensible. We are currently living, as I have said before, in the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. This epoch began in the middle of the 15th century. In other words, in the middle of the 15th century, European civilization and its American counterpart, as it later developed, received a different set of conditions for its existence. But, as of now, the results of these new conditions have not truly come into the world. Human beings in civilized nations are living mostly on the basis of habits, including habits of thinking, that are more appropriate to the prior, fourth post-Atlantean epoch. We have not steeped our intelligence in things that belong to the present. We have continued to teach ourselves Latin and Greek and so on. An ancient Greek would have had a different perspective on these matters. He would have been confused if in the time of ancient Greek culture a teacher had not taught his child Greek, but rather Egyptian or Persian or something of the sort. The time has now passed in which we can allow ourselves to linger on the remnants of the Greco-Roman era. All of the people who were born after the middle of the 15th century were, by and large, reincarnations of those who had lived as physical beings on the earth during the Greco-Roman period. What did they bring with them, these reincarnated souls? The heads that came from the bodies they had during the Greco-Roman period. So, if someone was born in, let us say, the 16th or 17th century, that person came to earth with a head, one could also say with cognitive soul faculties, in so far as the head transmits those faculties for our ego consciousness, that stemmed from the body that he or she had in the Greco-Roman era, and consequently with predispositions that also stemmed from that Greco-Roman era. But this period is now coming to an end, if it has not ended already. Soon there will no longer be people being born whose head stems from that epoch. Instead there are an increasing number of people being born who lived their previous incarnation in the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, or at the very least toward the end of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, when they led their lives in an entirely different way than those who lived in the thick of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch. This is not 
yet true of everyone, but it is true of many, particularly the leading figures of the world. If you want to live into human evolution with a fully awakened consciousness, then you must take this into consideration. Your head stems from your previous incarnation on the earth, and in your body you are preparing the things that will that will become your head in your next incarnation on the earth. And a time must come when an insufficient awareness of this connection in human beings between past and future incarnations becomes as clear an indication of stupidity as not knowing your own age, or believing that you were born only a few weeks ago even though you are an adult, or believing as a ten-year-old that you will always be ten and never grow into an elderly person. Nowadays, people live very egotistically during their life on earth. That most people believe that we all experience multiple lives on earth, but it is merely a belief and not the kind of practical everyday wisdom that this feeling of being in between incarnations must become. Just as it is common knowledge that a forty-year-old man was at one time a child and then a young adult and will go on to become an older man. We must expand the boundaries around the things that human consciousness grasps. This expansion will not occur in a living way unless it is fructified by knowledge that comes from spiritual science. Otherwise it will be nothing more than an abstract belief. Otherwise we will never get beyond people saying, Oh, yes, I know that I have already lived on earth countless times before, and I will live here on earth countless times in the future. But this kind of belief is meaningless. The only feeling of true integration with human evolution is the feeling that as far as your head is concerned, you are an older person because your head is the grown-up body of your prior incarnation. As far as the rest of your body goes, you are a baby, because that body will grow up into only a head in your next incarnation. This feeling for the human as a being with two distinct parts that has been placed at this moment in time must become an integral part of our living consciousness. And just as people are trying to determine the differences between individuals and populations and races of people by measuring their skulls and doing other similar and interesting things, so will they come to understand the differentiation between individuals living on the earth based upon soul spiritual knowledge that cannot be achieved without the kinds of basic foundation that we have been developing in recent days. People will have to question the soul spiritual characteristics of the human beings spread across the world. And salvation will not come until the science practiced at our universities is completely filled with and integrated into the kind of thinking and perceptions that we have learned in recent days. Our universities will lead humanity to its downfall unless they are fructified in all aspects of their work by that cosmic knowledge that nowadays can only be won through the pursuit of spiritual science. At the same time, the religious feelings of people in the future must be borne up by the knowledge that people can achieve of the soul what people can achieve of the soul spiritual world. There is no other way forward, because if we simply cast our gaze toward the soul spiritual world we will grow used to characterizing the groups of people living on the earth according to their particular soul spiritual characteristics, instead of merely discussing their physical characteristics as contemporary anthropology does. But this matter has a very serious and practical side. Certain things that play out in the present moment, things that lie at the root of the serious events of this time, cannot be looked at properly if one lacks the possibility of directing one's gaze toward the spiritual qualities of various segments of humanity. And in that regard, I would like to draw your attention to something that seems to me to be of particular importance. During this terrible war and its aftermath, well-intentioned people have often called for a unified Europe, Actually, this cry for a unified Europe was already voiced in 1870 by Ernest Renan, 
the French biographer of the life of Jesus and the Apostles. During the recent war it was reiterated often. Renan said that if Europe is to be saved it is absolutely necessary for a partnership to be established, a peaceful partnership between France, Great Britain and Germany. In particular, the people who are not beguiled by public opinion or by the assessments disseminated by others who were particularly focused on one issue or another supported this view during the war. The call came from many well-intentioned and impartial people. Now you can say, on the other hand, Europe's evolution during the past last few decades was such that it actually counteracted those things that a reasonable person would have to recognize as necessary if European civilization is to continue into the future. Without this peaceful partnership, said these impartial people, Europe is finished. But in the past few years we have never arrived at this peaceful partnership. At most we have the illusion of such a partnership. Now if we turn our eyes toward the outward relationships between European nations, but looking at the outer world in the interest of testing soul spiritual truths, we can clearly see what differentiates the three aspects of human existence. We must not forget here that since the beginning of the fifth post-Atlantean epoch and then during the end of that initial period, which has now ended completely, Europe developed and France progressively organized into an ever more unified nation whose various sections felt that they were part of a unified whole. We might say the soul life of every French man and woman moved toward the feeling of being part of a unified nation, bearing within its consciousness some part of the words, I am a Frenchman. You can study all that these four words came to mean over the course of centuries, I am a Frenchman. If we draw our attention to the development of that phrase, I am a Frenchman, then we must also take a look at the simultaneous events occurring in German development. Nothing developed within the now fallen German Empire that can be attached or ever could be attached to the phrase I am a German. To say loudly and passionately I am a German before the year 1848 would have gotten you locked up. You would have been thrown in jail. It was the worst political crime you could commit. People have forgotten this. It was the worst of political crimes to feel like a German. For in Germany local principalities had completely taken over the land, and it was forbidden, inwardly forbidden, to understand the whole of the territory occupied by the German peoples as a unity. For the first time in 1848 some people came up with the idea that you could actually consider all of the territory that belonged to the Germans as some sort of unified whole. But even then this idea was considered heretical. It was treated as heresy. Only those people who were historically bound up in the evolution of the German people felt this unity as something that was part of their inner experience. They saw it as something extremely personal. Read the way in which such people who thought and spoke truthfully about these matters, like Hermann Grimm, for example, looked back at their own youth, which still had taken place some time before the 1850s. Read about how they describe having no possibility of expressing the judgments residing in their feelings, their felt conclusion, I am a German. There is a tremendous difference here. But consider this huge difference inwardly. Consider the fact that even though it was a political crime, that the police would punish you for calling yourself a German, even in the first half of the 19th century, nevertheless the unified spiritual culture of Germany had already long been in existence. Goetheanism and everything that was a part of it was already there. Nobody read Goethe, but he had had his effect. Nobody understood Goethe, but he had said things of tremendous importance for all German people. But the, in quotes, German people were never allowed to express in the public sphere that they belonged together. At the very least, it was allowed to exist as a thought with no claim on reality. In other words, it lived within the German people as though it were something buried in the foundation of their consciousness, 
with no outward political reality. In its historical development, France took everything that was felt inwardly, everything that composed its unity, and made it into outward political reality. In Germany, everything that existed in external society contradicted what lived within these Germans as inner spiritual truth. This is a very significant difference between Central Europe and Western Europe. What you, When you take this up and when you can paint a picture of it in detail for yourself, only then will you understand the history of the 19th century. And when these things and all of the details about them live in the thought-feeling core, gemüt, of all Europeans, though right now they are counting on partnership and commonality of feeling, then very soon all of these feelings of fear that have led to the present downward spiral will cease. But we will not be able to develop these kinds of international feelings unless we are able to consider the totality of the human being and begin to understand each person in regard to his or her intelligence and capacity for wanting and desiring. For in turning our consciousness toward these secrets of the human being, we become aware of the need to engage such considerations. These considerations we, which we have just gone about engaging are what teach us the truth about what all of this depends upon. Why is it the case that the French consolidated into such a compact collective of people in which each individual felt he was a Frenchman, which was a feeling forbidden to the German people until the arrival of Bismarck's German Empire? What was the cause of that? The reason is that in France a continuation of the old Greco-Roman being was founded, a being that I have described to you here for weeks as predominantly a political judicial being. This political judicial being came into Latin culture from the Egyptians via the Romans. The French people took it over. There is no population on earth that has a better feeling for judicial and political life than the French. If, on the other hand, you were to find the proper way to penetrate through those, shall we say, oppressive aspects of German evolution in the 19th century, the things that counteracted any outward political developments, that made it necessary to lock people up if they felt that they were German rather than Prussian or Bavarian or Austrian, then you will see clearly into those things with which everything else is connected. And if you study the details concretely of what German spiritual life became at the turn of the 19th century, if you do not study this in the way that unprincipled schools drill it into people, if you study the way in which Goetheanism flowed into the great spirits who are all but forgotten, those who were celebrated as great during the spiritual antipode, if you study in the way Goetheanism flowed into men like Troxler and Schubert and so on, then you will discover that the utter lack of talent for political life, the dormant nature of the German people when it came to political life, the danger of being locked up if you desired to be a statesman for the whole of Germany, all of this actually predestined the German people to develop a great understanding for the spiritual, for spiritual life. This has been beaten back by the industrial commercial developments in Germany since the 1870s. These developments effectively did away with the German spirit. They came as invaders from without and took away everything that was connected with spiritual life. Goetheanism has been forgotten. The fact that a German like Leibniz, for example, once lived among the Germans is more important for our school teachers to know than the writings of Cicero. But nowadays they hardly know that Leibniz ever lived. These are things that come into our considerations and are more deeply seated than all the other things that people nowadays name as the differences between Central Europe and Western Europe. And when people today talk about the need for peace accords between Central Europe and Western Europe, they must understand clearly that the whole spiritual evolution of Europe proves that such a peace can only come into existence 
when the German people come to feel about themselves, we are not destined for the outward legal political life. We are called upon to practice spiritual life. But they must be enabled to do this. Presently it has been made impossible for them. Presently they also have no accountability for it. We must come to recognize that the truly political people are the French people, because it is that population that best understands how the individual human being feels as a member of a political state. In this way we have divided the spiritual life from the rights or political life in the big picture of European civilization. These things are simultaneously distributed within a given population in the form of individual gifts and proclivities. And the economic life, the actual area of new human evolution, is given to the English-American people. Everything related to the understanding of the economic life has found its most thorough thought in England and America. The French do not understand anything about economics. They are better bankers. The Germans have never understood the first thing about economics, and they have absolutely no talent for it. And when they have attempted to practice economics in recent decades, insofar as they spoke about an economic boom and having their own place under the sun or something along these lines, the real meaning of all of this talk was that they were speaking about something for which they had no talent, and in speaking about they knocked the true German being to the floor. For even everything that popped up in the form of economic parliamentarianism in the second half of the nineteenth century came over from England. All the way into Hungary the people who are considered good parliamentarians when it comes to economics are students of English thought. If you take a look at which people in the parliaments were the most effective in bringing forward parliamentarianism, as has been the case for some time in the Austrian parliament and for an especially long period of time in the Hungarian parliament. And if you then take a look at where these people studied, you will find it was in England that they learned this economic parliamentarianism. And when you ask where did the German Social Democratic Party come from, then you will find Marx and Engels had to go to England and study English economic relationships in order to cook up the theories that were then taken up in German spiritual life and work through to their ultimate consequences. And where are Leninism and Trotskyism initially rooted? The roots begin in English economic thought, except that the English are wary of thinking through the ultimate consequences of their economic ideas. So here we have the three areas about which I have often spoken. I have said that they must establish a threefold relationship with one another, German spiritual, French political judicial, English economic. How will we be able to discover the possibility of international cooperation? Through an outpouring of the principle of threefolding over these areas. For only in this way will it be possible for those who have a particular talent for one area to engage in an exchange with the others. This will not be possible otherwise. This is the spiritual impulse. For this reason more than any other we must study the history of the nineteenth century. You cannot study history if you have only been taught the things that are taught nowadays in school. This history is only there to be forgotten, because you cannot do anything with this history in your life. A history lesson is meaningful only when you can do something in your life with what you have learned. But you can develop such a history lesson only when you are able to see through the whole of a human being. And the same is true of the other branches of our current higher education. The way in which things are currently taught in our universities will lead to our downfall. Ascending to some new beginning for our education can only result through fructification of knowledge in spiritual science. All of the things that are supposed to occur nowadays have already been prepared in our history. 
But do not think for a moment that the correct historical relationships can be properly seen by anyone who is not familiar enough with anthroposophy to understand, for example, these three spiritual figures, reference to the drawing, and their relationship to one another, or understand the things that we were speaking about yesterday and the day before. For only by ascending to such things as one is able to regard others in the full depth of their being. Let me read that again. For only by ascending to such thoughts is one able to regard others in the full depth of their being. Otherwise one has no interest for the other. Otherwise one is contented with the things that were given by schoolroom science and is compelled to spend one's free time doing those things that people nowadays spend their free time doing. Such things should be spoken of far and wide, so that there might be a sufficiently large number of people who have an understanding of them. Everything nowadays is dependent on there being a sufficiently large number of people who have some understanding of such things. Until there is this sufficiently large number of people who have such an understanding, we can do nothing with these things in the world. We cannot simply turn to institutions. We cannot simply establish new organizational practices. Rather, it is necessary that there be as many people as possible who have knowledge of these things in their cognitive soul faculties, that we might then establish new institutions with these people. Then the oppositional forces will not be able to stand against us any more. Nowadays you will discover something strange if you examine the thoughts that people have about European life, about the way in which European life should play out between one person and the next. I must tell you here a little about the specific details regarding what occurs. Today I would like to include just a small probe into all of the important concerns that we have before us to consider. Monsieur Frère, who, as I told you, perpetuated the slanderous rumor that I had been an advisor to the former German emperor, that I have been in essence the Rasputin to the German emperor, and so on, he was told off by Dr. Bus in an open letter. And in a postscript to that letter I also mentioned what I have explained here in the past about my relationship, or should I say lack thereof, to the German emperor. Now the man had to admit that he had lied but he admitted it in a very particular way, a way that is also characteristic of the times. I will attempt as clearly as possible to offer to you in German the French sentences that he wrote. I am actually very glad to present them to you in German, for in German they take on a certain character which I would like to lend to them. So, after the letter from Dr. Bus comes the following, quote, We, the editors, have given the above letter from Dr. Roman Bus to our correspondent. Uh, this is referring to the Herr Freire, who sent us the following reply. The above document is typical for a psychologist. Here we see what Latin irony becomes when seen by German eyes. Most likely these people, uh, he means those who have German eyes, take everything seriously. But my readers, they did not allow themselves to be misled. My article contains comedy, de la plaisanterie, uh, but no ill will, Consente, sorry, I can't read the French. And I was poorly educated. I identify this as my fault, in the hopes that my partner in conversation will not hold it against me. Close quote, as it were. Elegant. He assumes that he will not hold it against me. My partner in conversation. I mean the sociologist. I'm sorry. Continuing the quote. By partner in conversation, I mean the sociologist whom I referred to as a sociologist, Dr. Steiner, and not the signer of the above letter, to whom I made no mention in my article, Dr. Boos. Indeed, Ofe, what is one to make of this affair? Close quote, finally. And so, a man is able to excuse himself with such useless words after not only lying, but committing a most base and vile slander, but you run the risk of being called stupid and unrefined if you take these things so, in quotes, seriously. If you claim that the defamation is not a, and then there's a couple of French words here, pleasant theory, but rather a meconcetta. Sorry, I'm not sure what those are. Then it goes on, 
And now we come to something particularly noteworthy. Quote, At the time I wrote my article, I knew Rudolf Steiner only from his printed works. Since that time I have come to know him through people who are close to him. My opinion of him has changed entirely, and I had prepared an article in which I presented my respect for the moral significance of his personal work. I admit that the letter from Mr. R. Bus has left me somewhat cold. Close quote. That is just wonderful, is it not? Quite wonderful. He would have written the most beautiful article full of accolades if only someone had not told him off. Still, I cannot be persuaded by the idea that this is simply a characteristic of the Latin race as opposed to the Germanic race mentioned earlier, for it would be rather offensive if one were to regard all lies and slander in the Latin race as something elegantly laudatory as merely pleasantrie. This cannot be only a peculiar characteristic of the Latin race. Now the gentleman continues, quote, I could provide answers to many different things in this letter, but what would be the use, Akimon? One of the qualities of Latin speech is brevity. I was wrong. I see plainly to abandon the realm of veritable fa verifiable facts. I take back my erroneous claims, and I conclude from this experience that the rumors which circulate about, even if they come from a variety of sources and from people whom one has every right to consider well informed, can nevertheless be false. I will take careful note of this. Close quote. So, first of all, this man is so naive as to believe that he must take all rumors which circulate to be true, since he is only now taking note of the fact that they might not be. And secondly, yes, here we again run the risk of being considered unrefined, or as Fréro would put it, German. Just try to think through elegant thoughts like these. It is impossible, is it not? For apparently you are not permitted to do so without belonging to that group of people about whom Fréro says, and then there's a French phrase I can't pronounce, close quote, but you cannot help but do so. You have to ask yourself. Quote, so he takes careful note of the fact that not all rumors that circulate are to be believed. But if you are a person like Clara, then would you not be precisely the kind of person most like to bring those rumors out into a wide variety of circles? Close quote. Well, there is no use in seeking any true thoughts behind the words of such people. From a document such as this, you can clearly see that it is not a matter of bringing such people to reason. We can only hope to make the rest of the public aware of the fact that shameful people like this are running about in the world, writing articles and spreading falsehoods. It is not a matter of repudiating these people, but rather a matter of rendering them harmless. For the fact that these people exist, this is what is truly harmful. When nothing happens in the world out of spiritual wisdom, we rapidly move ever farther away from the time in which such a sensibility can truly spread throughout the world. For in the end, materialists of all stripes and from all sides will continue increasingly to speak in this way about those who take things up spiritually. Quote, ah, these people, they take everything so seriously, close quote. Soon enough it will be considered serious to speak at all about spirit. And indeed it is serious, but then we are not supposed to be serious. For as long as this kind of sensibility spreads, and it is spreading now, there will be no solid ground on which to better the state of things in Europe. These are the people who have brought Europe to this point. But we must work to ensure that a sufficient number of people gain an understanding of the fact so that it will be different. This should already be evident now to those who have, in some manner, encountered true spiritual scientific striving. Next Friday I will speak particularly about the development of imperialism in the world, which means that it will be an episodic lecture, a brief overview of the historical development of imperialism from the most ancient times, from Egyptian imperialism through to present-day imperialism. <laughs>